no matter how many times people who know about track and field tell you that a fast 40 yard dash does not project into a fast 100 meter 100 meter dash time that the fastest guys in the NFL aren't necessarily the fastest people in the entire world. You cannot convince football fans, football media, mainstream media who only parachute into track and field every four years. You cannot convince them otherwise until someone puts it to the test. And once the test happens, you see the difference between NFL fast and track fast. And for a day, everybody says, ooh, wow. And then next year, I promise you guys, we're going to be still having the same debate. So yesterday, because we record on Monday mornings, Sunday afternoon, DK Metcalf of the Seattle Seahawks lined up at the Mount Sac Relays in the men's 100 meters. And let's remember how this all started was that DK Metcalf had that iconic uh, end-to-end chase down tackle on Buda Baker. His top recorded speed during that chase was 22.64 miles per hour, which doesn't necessarily mean a lot to a, 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 a sprint nerd. 10.1 10.1 meters per second, which caused football writers to start doing the math and calculate that if he maintained that speed for 100 meters, he'd run 9.88, which the football writers said was faster than a lot of track people. Uh, that analysis leaves out a lot of variables and you can't reliably project based on one data point from somebody's GPS what their 100 meter time is going to be. You have to put it to the test. So DK Metcalf, to his credit, put it to the test. He signed up, lined up. Uh, and got smoked in track and field terms, right? He lost his heat by a quarter of a second. But the interesting thing is DK Metcalf ran 10.37 seconds in the 100 meters. He got last in his heat. But for a guy who has not run track since high school, um, spends most of his time playing football and just trained three solid months uh, to run track, 10.36 is a more, 10.37 is a more than respectable time. This would be like, uh, Terrell, remember when Terrell Owens used to say he would play in the NBA? Um, if you if if Terrell Owens made the NBA, you put him in the NBA for one night, and he's and he had more points, and he had more points than turnovers, more points than fouls. That's a successful night because for the most part, they throw you into the NBA. All there's nothing you can do but foul out. So DK Metcalf um, surpassed my expectations. Ran 10.36. Dave Zirin, uh, what? How did you react when you when you saw the results and saw the footage of the race? Well, first and foremost, it reminded me of footage I once saw of Jadavian Clowney running track when he was in high school. I'm sure you've seen that footage, Morgan. Just being someone so much bigger and so much clearly stronger than everybody else, still pretty much keeping pace is just an amazing sight aesthetically. Uh, That was my first thought. The second thought was that I was thinking about, with all due respect, Morgan, all the track and field nerds who were putting DK Metcalf down in the weeks leading up to it. And that was real. That was real on social media. And I was just like, nah, you should be absolutely like thanking DK Metcalf for the attention that he's bringing to the sport. Yes. Let's give him some love for that. And then the last thing I thought was one of the things as someone who does, uh, you know, I'm a youth sports coach and I care a lot about youth sports. One of the things I can't stand is the youth sports specialization. Thank you. The idea that you should only play one sport year round because that's the way you're going to be a pro. There are so many reasons that, that that's wrong, not just physically, but also mentally and socially that I can't even get into them all on this show but suffice it to say dk metcalf showing off this idea that you can be a multi-sport participant and be successful and actually engage i mean his love for track and field bursts out of his chest and that's a beautiful thing and i think that's something that's actually terrific modeling for young Mm -hmm. athletes to see yeah it's funny like the two groups of people that were most down on dk metcalf in the aftermath were like the hardcore track and field snobs who are very much like boxing fans and that they love the sport so much that they almost hate it. And like, no matter what happens, <laughs> they're going to find something to complain about. And then like the football people who actually thought DK Metcalf was going to be faster than Olympic sprinters and think that because he finished last in the heat that this in his heat, that this was some type of failure because they don't have context for that type of speed. All they've ever seen is football speed. So the, they think the fastest football person necessarily is the fastest person in the world, but like context. And again, they're laboring under all these false expectations because that 9.88 was an absolutely fake number pulled basically out of thin air and you can't measure anybody against that because the number of people in the world in a given year that run 9.88 or faster is like i don't know three four (laughs) right so someone's not a 235 pound guy is not going to come straight from the gridiron and do that but i you know if you'd asked me i would have said hey anything 
faster than 10-6 and no injuries, that's a great day for DK Metcalf. He got through it in one piece, uh, significantly faster than 10.6. So that's a great day. Megan, what did you think of the run? I thought it was great for the exact same reasons that Dave mentioned and just giving the track uh, track and field community some eyeballs that without DK Metcalf would not have been paying attention to this race. And they got to see the potential of who could be in the Olympics in a couple of months. So I thought it was fantastic. The fact that, you know, you got extra eyeballs. It's always great when you can get extra eyeballs on any sport that wouldn't have necessarily been there, but you know, a huge respect to him because he put his ego on the line. He put yes. his pride on the line and he put it on the line with all the talk he had been doing, you know, with, with the lead up to it. And he said, you know what? I'm just going to go out and I'm going to run this and I'm going to see how I can compete and how I can compare. He could have easily just kept talking and talking and talking and never actually put his pride to the test and put his yes. feet to the test. But he put all of that aside and said, you know what? If I think I can beat somebody, if I think I can run this, you know, this 100 meter and I can do it quicker than people expect me to, I'm going to prove it. So he put everything on the line to go out and simply just prove that he could contend with the best of them. And I think truly he did, to your point, you know, 10-3, no one expected him to run that fast, aside from the football people who thought he could run it in 9-8, which, let's right. be real, a lot more analytics go into the actual speed of sprinters than just taking the GPS from end zone to end zone on exactly. turf with cleats, which are completely different than track cleats and a completely different surface. Like, you can't just translate it that way. It's it's not, it's like the U.S. exchange with the Canadian exchange. Dollar for dollar doesn't always work when it comes to currency here, people. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I, I have to give him his respect because one, he put he put everything on the line and two, he put in a speed that no one, no one really thought he was going to be able to do. To your point, 10-6 was going to be fantastic. And, you know, biggest thing is, no injuries. Seahawks are pretty happy about this. <laughs> Injury free. He can go into minicamp. Dave, were you going to say something? No, no. I, I oh. Megan nailed it. Um, although I, I did have to say, like, like the people who said that a football player could, it would translate to track, just also aren't keeping into account issues like a running start on a football field. Yes. Adrenaline yeah. on a football field. I mean, it's it's like people who who look at like the hundred meters that someone might run in a four by one hundred race. And, you know, when they're getting the running start and being yep. past the baton and saying, my goodness, if they could only do that on 100 meters, it's a complete lack of understanding. Wow. Um, I spoke to a Wyoming Atias, 1968 track legend, go. and she was telling me about the arthritis that she has now in her fingers mm -hmm. because of all the years of pushing off those fingers to run right. track. I mean, that, that's a very intense physical operation, and people don't realize the the full-body athletic endeavor that goes into it. Yeah, okay, and two two last points is, and one day, this will be near and dear to your heart, right, is that a lot of the, 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 the fascination and speculation around this is generational, and it has to do with the fact that it's been a few years since we've seen something like this, but if you grew up watching sports in the 80s, you saw this basically every offseason. We had the NFL's fastest man competition and the fastest guys in the league, and some of these guys were ex-Olympic sprinters. They would run against each other, and you would actually see who was the fastest in the league instead of all this talk about it, and the person that won most of the time was Dave's boy, uh, the king, the original king of the chase down tackle, Daryl Green, who was a legitimate uh, sub 10 one sprinter and when you saw him play on the field you it, it was not a surprise but back in those days you would see the Herschel Walkers of the world run in the offseason at big time track meets or Bo Jackson Deion Sanders these guys have competed in high college track at a high level you can actually go look up their times you don't have to guess how fast they are but to Dave's point we're in a, we're in a different era now everybody wants to specialize early um, and also in the social media era there's a lot invested in the idea of being the fastest as opposed to having to go out and prove it, right? And the race is the truth. And the, and the, what fascinates me about audiences is that, and we in the sports media as well, and we really need to do a better job of, of contextualizing these things, but we are more uh, fascinated with like what might be than what we already know is. So if we've gone back 10 years ago, right? Trendon Holiday, little short guy. He was like Tyreek Hill. He's faster than Tyreek Hill in a straight line. Um, Played for the Broncos, played for the Texans, but he uh, he was an NCAA champion in, in the 100 meters. Now, if he had said, I'm trying out for the world championship teams this, this year, people would have said, oh, yeah, well, that's a tough team to make. We'll see what happens. 
DK Metcalf says, oh, I think I can make the team. Everyone's like, well, of course he can make it. But like, which of these guys actually had the statistics that would allow you to make that projection? It's the guy who uh, won the NCAA title. But like that type of data actually makes it, having that much data on hand makes it less interesting to the sports media world who would rather talk about this stuff and try to talk uh, speak into existence the reality of DK Metcalf being as fast as Trayvon Brumell. And that's just not it. And last point, because we Canadians know uh, firsthand the pitfalls of bad track and field math uh, for journalists when in 1996, Bob Costas declared that Michael Johnson was faster than Donovan Bailey because he took the 200 meter time, cut it in half and said 9.66 times two equals 1932. Ergo, the 200 meter guy is faster. Today's point, the second 100 meters has a running start and that makes all the difference. And so if there's a lesson here, it's well, two lessons. One, uh, it's refreshing to see DK Metcalf put it on the line in an old school way, the way Daryl Green, Ron Brown, Willie Galt, uh, Herschel Walker, Google these guys if you're too young to remember them, the way they used to do it every winter. Um, and two, sports journalists, uh, before you throw the numbers around, figure out what they mean. Help yourself, help your audience.